I thought you were doing good. I love you, man. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> you were doing great. Thank you, Lord. Just one more thing about Colombo. And don't ever forget. Never. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Well, let's just close our eyes for a moment. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite you to rise up in our heart today. Make the word of God super plain and simple. We love you. You're here to lead and guide us in truth, and we're following. And we say by faith, we fully understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We fully understand what Christ has done for us and who we are in him. We fully understand where you're leading us and guiding us and taking us. We understand our future. And we accept and we receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Listen, <clears throat> open up your heart, open up your mind, and realize that more than anything, God wants you to be a success. We're going to talk about overcoming failures. Hallelujah. You have any of those? Have you had any times when it seems like the going gets rough, right? We had a president that said, when the going gets rough, the rough get going. <laughs> right? But it really isn't the rough that gets going. When the, t when the going gets rough, we take a break and just say, Jesus, you've already done this. Yeah. Right? I don't have to rough it out. I don't have to tough it out. Now, a lot of things we do, it seems like it, because we're not on that perfect level yet, naturally, even though we are spiritually. If we could begin to realize that the will of God is so far in front of us, right? Our spirit man is one with Christ. You know, the Bible says that you have no need of a teacher, for you know all things. Now, people look at that and say, well, oh, I don't have to listen to anybody. No, it's talking about who you really are, not who you think you are. See, all of us think we're the person we brushed their teeth this morning, huh? Yeah. The one we threw in the shower and scrubbed up and dressed and, you know, and, and put pretty stuff on us and, you know, and we think this is us. But you know what? It says that when we leave this body, it says we're going to be present with the Lord. Well, if this was you, then why did you leave it, right? And he says that it was made from the dust, and to the dust shall it return. Amen? And, and there's only a couple of people that have made it into heaven with their body, right? Right? We know that Enoch was one of them because Enoch was not, you know, and he took a he took a walk with God. And I guess they got closer to heaven than than they were to earth. And God says, come on, you know, and spend a couple of days with me. Well, it says the day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So <laughs> Enoch has been there probably about six days, almost a year, almost a week. You know, and he may be one of those that come back. There's, there's two people that are coming back. They call them witnesses, right? We know that Elijah, you know, got a, got a chariot sent down. It's, a, it's a, a heavenly taxi, right? And it came down and swooped him up and, and took him off, right? And um, he's, he's up there also. We know that Jesus suffered and died, was raised on the third day, and that his body took on glorification, right, and immortality, and then he was lifted up into there, and he's seated at the right hand of God. Amen? And it says that we need to know all the things that Christ has done for us. The problem with the natural and the spiritual 
is that the natural really doesn't get that it's the spiritual that leads and guides us. We keep thinking that it's the natural part of us that is, is persevering. And the more that we become dead to self and the more that we uh, do good things and help other people and say please and thank you and all that, the natural, then that's going to bring pleasure in the spiritual, right? But since he said, you know all things, right? So what are teachers for? Teachers are to pound in to this natural brain and natural mind what your spirit already knows. It already knows. It's called what? A witness. Okay, so we're witnessing. How many of you know that sometimes you're sitting there and somebody teaches something or, or you're reading the Bible and it goes, whoa, it's what? A defining moment. What happens? The light turns on. Oh, you've been wondering about a verse for a long time and somebody teaches it or you know, or you're just reading it and you see it in a different light, right? And something happens. Where? In here. Oh, you know? Oh, that really warmed my brain when the Lord showed me this. You know, what is it? It warms your heart. There's something about the core, the being on the inside, right? Jesus called it the belly, right? And that's the reason some of us have more room for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, he's kind of squished in some people, but <laughs> right. But it says Jesus said what? He was walking along as right before he was going to be crucified. How many of you know he faced a problem? Huh? And all of this was on him and his his the people closest to him didn't believe in him and like him. That was his brothers and sisters, and, right? And they're trying, they're, they're trying to get him together, you know, to go down to Jerusalem because they had the, the holidays that were there and, and the sacrifices and stuff that was going on. And Jesus said, no, yeah, I'm not going down. And they got a little upset at him, right? This is a family deal. And so they took off and then Jesus left. All right. So what? It wasn't that he was, wasn't going down. He wasn't going down with them. Why? They didn't understand. They didn't understand. And part of our failures is that people don't understand. Hello? You have bill collectors. They don't understand. <laughs> that you're not trying to get away with something, right? And we want to do whatever it takes, you know, to be upright, to be lawful, to do the things that we should do. But there's sometimes it just doesn't come out that way. We want to be very loving to our spouse all the time. But sometimes, come on, sometimes it isn't so loving. Well, what happens? How do we overcome that failure? See, a lot of times we just get sorry, right? But you know, sorry doesn't solve things. Amen. What solves things is to know who you are. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when I say know it, to really know it, there's two forms of knowing. Knowing, the first one is just information. What in my brain says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know, how do you know that? The Bible said so. Okay. I don't feel righteous. I don't always act righteous. Well, how does righteous act? How does righteous feel? Well, it's different than what I am. It's different than how I see things. It's different than how I feel things. Hang on a minute. Well, since God's the one that made us righteous, why don't we find out what he means righteousness is, right? And so I'm righteous because God said so. Do you know that righteousness, spiritual righteousness, is a position? Yes. It's not a feeling. It's not an action. It's not what you do or don't do. Hello? 
Righteousness is a gift that was given to us. We had nothing to do with it. Nothing. Jesus was a gift that was given to us. We had nothing to do with Jesus coming. Right? Can you imagine Jesus up there in heaven? You got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Godhead. Right? And they're looking down there, and, and Adam blows it. And the Father, you know, looks over the Holy Spirit and says, what are we going to do now? And the Holy Spirit says, well, one of us has to go down there and, and become like them and die. And then they both look at Jesus. <laughs> right? Could you imagine if you're Jesus? <laughs> hey, hang on a minute. <laughs> Holy Spirit, your wisdom. Isn't there another way? But Father... <laughs> Right. But the Bible says with joy, he came, he came. Do you know it cost him? We have no idea what it cost him. A lot of times people think, well, he was God. He just like came down, did his thing and went back to heaven, you know, and, and no. See, when Jesus was in the garden, it says that he began to pray and the people that were the closest to him couldn't even stay awake. He says, could you not? We're, we're talking about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Lamb of God coming over and pleading. Could you not stay awake for an hour? You realize that sometimes we feel like that. We feel like we let God down. I should have prayed more. I don't know why I don't pray more, God. I'm just, I'm so sorry. I'm weak. I'm just, and we go through this whole rehearsal why we can't do what we should be doing. And the whole time, God the Father sitting on his throne is looking at God the Son who accomplished everything. And he says, I don't know what they're talking about. And God the Son looks up at God the Father and says, Father, I don't know what they're talking about either. <laughs> and so they both look at God the Spirit saying, you need to teach them something. <laughs> and that's why he's here right now Amen. inside of you to teach you something that the Father already knows, the Son already knows, the Holy Spirit already knows, and we're learning. Yes. Say, thank God, I'm learning. thank God I'm learning. It isn't about where we are. It's about where we're going, right? There's a place called there, right? Okay, where is there? Have you ever wondered where is your there? You know, where are you going to end up? What's going to happen to you? What does God have planned for you? Where should you be? Where will you be? Right? You know where you're going to be? Where you are. See, where we really are is where God placed us. Where did he place us? He placed us in Christ. And in Christ, we're righteous. You know what the Father says? You've already done everything I desired you to do. And you go, well, hang on now. I, I just got started. You know, I'm just going at this. I, I know there's a whole lot more for me to do. I know that I can become better, right? There's a lot of things I can, I, I can still quit and, and get out of my life. And there's some other things that I could do, you know. So we see ourselves in process. God sees us complete. Amen. The Bible says God sees us complete in Christ. So in Christ, if you're in Christ, if you're not in Christ, we can get you into Christ. It just takes a couple of minutes, right? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ died for me and took my sins. I accept and receive him as my Lord, my Savior right now, and I'll live with you forever. I'm what? Born again. Are you born again? If you're born again, you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're perfect. 
If you're in Christ, you're complete. If you're in Christ, you know all things. If you're in Christ, see, that's what he says. Jesus says, it was given to you. Now, if God gives you something, do you have it? Wait a minute. Or are you waiting for it? Is it going to turn up someday? Depending upon how you live your life. Hello? If he says it's given, it's what? It's given. If he gave it to me, I have it. Do you have something you don't know you have? I remember I'll tell on my wife. I remember that she was on the phone with someone walking around all over the place. And it says, what are you doing? It says, well, I'm looking for my phone. <laughs> I can't find my phone. <laughs> I know I had it a minute ago. Right? Or you see the people always looking around saying, what are you looking for? My keys. What's in your hand? Oh. Right? How many things do we look for that we already have? Right? We're looking for appreciation. We're looking for acceptance. We're looking for something different that's going to change our attitude and behavior about us. Right? And we haven't realized we've already got it. Whatever you need in life to be an overcomer, you've already got it. You've already got it. Well, you know what? The Bible says love one another, and there's some that I'm working on. Right? And I'm trying to build this love up, and every time I think I'm able to love them, they do something stupid. Hello? But it says the, the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is what? Love. Well, the fruit of the Holy Spirit isn't uh, trying to get ripe. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is already ripe. You have the Spirit of God in you. That means you have the full, ripe love of God in you. It's there. What it is is our choice. Do we choose to pick it? Do we choose to eat it? Do we choose to accept it? Do we choose to walk in it? Do we choose to flow in it? Do we choose to believe it? And there's your choice. When we begin to say, I walk in the fullness of the love of God. Hallelujah. Okay? Even you know you're lying. But the Bible says that's true. That's true. Why? Because we look at things more in the natural than we do in the spiritual. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I want you to just put your brains in neutral a little bit. And contemplate and see things maybe a little different than you've seen. Hello? See, we've been trained how to think. It might have been good training. But then in some things, it might not have been that good. See, the heart grabs hold of everything that has ever happened in your heart, in your life. Every good thing, every bad thing, every indifferent thing, everything is culminated in the heart, and the heart knows it and remembers it well. The mind chooses what it remembers. Hello? And the more dramatic an event or something happens, the more impressed it is in our heart. And whatever it is that is impressed within our heart dominates what we think. Right? Have you ever tried to not think something? Forget it. I'm not going to think about that anymore. And the more that you don't think about it, the more you think about it, right? You ever get one of those little jingles or little songs stuck in your head? It's like, ah, quit! <laughs> and it's usually something silly, something dumb, right? 
Or you ever had somebody treat you a certain way or say something or do something? It's like, and you rehearse over and over and over, you know, what you would say to them, you never do, but it's what you would, right? And that's what goes over us and over us and over us. Even husbands and wives are with, <laughs> anyway, probably should move on. <laughs> and we start rehearsing things. Say rehearse. Isn't it something that it's easier to rehearse the negative bad things than it is positive good things? How often do you walk around thinking, I love my wife. She's so awesome. She's great. She's a gift from God. I thank you, Jesus. I love her. I just, I just love her. You know, yeah, that was, that was, you know, probably within six months of your marriage. But if your spouse does something that offends you, embarrasses you, or something like that, how often do you walk around saying, oh, God, thank you. They're a gift to me. I love them so much. <laughs> yeah. we, you know, we don't. Why? Our self-centeredness takes control. And you know what self-centeredness is? It's the pathway to failure. What do we call this message? Overcoming, overcoming failure. It's overcoming what? Self-centeredness. That's where the pathway to victory is. You've got to understand and know that you've already been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not I that liveth. Hang on a minute. It's not I that liveth. Paul, what are you talking about? It's not I that liveth. Well, if it's not you, who is it? But it's Christ that liveth in me. It's Christ that liveth in me. Now, I want you to vision the Lamb of God doing the things you do. That's enough. <laughs> right? There's one translation that says, I was crucified with Christ and I'm dead, but Jesus is using my body. Hello? And see, right there, that can bring us into condemnation. But we know there's another truth that says, there is therefore now no condemnation. Do you think that God gets shocked at some of the things we say and do? Do you think that God somewhere in his word said that in order to be favored by me, you've got to be perfect in the natural? And the more perfect you are in the natural, the more you deserve my blessings. That's what the heart says. That's what the natural mind says. That's what religion says. But God said what? I see you complete in my son. The father just looks to his right and he sees completion. It's completed. It's completed. You know, the Bible says that Jesus left nothing undone. Nothing. Nothing. And he suffered and died for who? For all. Who are the all? Well, it's all that believe, all that accept, all that receive. Amen? So if we're left with a choice, then we can still choose not to accept. We can choose not to believe. We can choose not to act. We can choose not to be in faith. We can choose not to build up hope. We can choose all the negative things, and yet God says it's already planted in you the ability to do everything you need to do to walk out my will in your life, right? It's already there. But see, religion tells us you don't really have it. You need to pray. You need to, you need to travail. You need to get hold of God. Beat on the, the gates of heaven. I thought, 
Heaven doesn't have gates. Isn't that interesting? Hello? Watch this. <clears throat> Acts 2, verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, who is that? The Lamb of God. The Son of God. The one of the immaculate birth. The one that was raised up for the purpose of dying, becoming sin for us. A man approved of God. Now, the interesting thing about this is you would think that God approved of him before he sent him. Son of God. Isn't he approved? Huh? Look it. A man approved of God among you. How? How was that approval given? By miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of all of you, as you yourselves also know it. You were there. You were there. So how did the approving come? It, uh, the approving came through the manifestation of the love and the compassion of God through Christ in the miraculous healings and signs and wonders, right? See, religion kind of sets that aside and says, no, it's all about morals now. <laughs> Say please and thank you. Don't cuss. Don't, don't spit nor chew. <laughs> or go with girls that do. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so everything is about your actions, what you're doing, not doing. Oh, I'm really sorry, God, why I slipped up. I slipped up and what? Well, I called my husband an idiot. Is that all you called him? <laughs> it wasn't about action. It wasn't about what we did and didn't do. He said what? The approval came when he opened up and let the love and the power of God flow through him to bring the miraculous, to bring healing, to bring signs and wonders and miracles. That's what sets churches apart. I'm not against churches. I'm not. And there's a lot of Christians that will never, ever feel that approval because they'll never pray for anyone. They'll never see miracles. They'll never see signs and wonders. But they're going where we're going. And we're not going to get a big fanfare. See, everyone thinks that... That, that everyone that goes there that, that really did something awesome, that there's a bigger parade. Could you imagine when Oral Roberts walked into heaven, when Billy Graham walked into heaven, when Smith Wiggles were, oh, man. I, I, I mean, whoa. But then there's you. <laughs> you may slip in and nobody even know. What are you doing here? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I just took my last breath on earth and here I am. Open my eyes and here I am. Was well, anybody know you were coming? <laughs> well, I don't know. I wasn't planning it on myself. <laughs> All right. Well, let me see if we can get a few people over here to, to, to do a little dance or something, you know. <laughs> Come on. See what I'm saying? But see... What does scripture say? Scripture says we're all equal. It's religion that says certain people get bigger celebrations. Okay. How did they do what they did? Good question. How did they do what they did? How did Billy Graham win millions of people to the Lord? Everyone said, oh, man, I just love to be like Billy Graham. Why? Because I know that we need to win people to the Lord, right? And the more people I win to the Lord, okay, the, what? the more approved I am, right? I'm fulfilling the will of God, and it's awesome. We need to get as many as we can. And that's really true as far as winning people, right? But how did Billy get in the place where the grace of God was there to win people? Anybody ever see Billy Graham, 
or in a service. I was, I was in one. Praise God. It was awesome, wasn't it? Okay. He's not a tongue talker. He's, <laughs> he's not a Pentecostal. He's, he's a Baptist, right? And I, I'm a pastor. Nancy and I went to a, to a meeting of his in, in a baseball stadium, probably 50,000 people there or more. And we're, we're sitting there and he's preaching. And it was a bit of a dry sermon. Right? And then he got to the end. He says, I'm going to have an invitation. And many of you all over the stadium are going to come. Find your way and come down and we'll wait for you. And those of you that rode with other people, they'll wait for you. And we had a guy sitting down here that was like from an outlaw motorcycle gang. And he was drunk. And he was belligerent and, and loud. And, and you're just, you know, you, you, you're believing, you're trying to channel Elijah and call fire down from heaven, you know, with this guy. And, you know, and, and, the, and the moment he says, uh, many of you are going to come, all of a sudden this guy like started crying. I'm going, what's going on? And you begin to feel something. And what you felt was, was that spiritual net. And even though he hadn't uh, invited people down yet, the very presence of God was pulling and tugging, right? He says, now, come down. And I got halfway out of my seat. My brain was going, you're a spilled pastor. You're born again. <laughs> right? <laughs> and I, I, I felt like I need to be down there. You know why? That's where the Holy Ghost was sucking everybody out of their seats. It was phenomenal. Phenomenal. All right? Did you guys experience something like that? Yeah. Wasn't it, it wasn't that phenomenal? I mean, it's just like, you know, it's tangible. Right? Now, look at that. What is that? Approval. That was a sign, a wonder, a miracle. An act of grace. Now, Billy didn't believe things like we did. Now, he wasn't against miracles. He and Oral Roberts had many conversations. As a matter of fact, in one of Billy Graham's meetings, someone got up out of their wheelchair and walked forward and was completely, totally healed, just like that. Right? But he wrote, that is not what God called me to do. He said, God called Oral Roberts to do that. And so Billy loved Oral, and Oral loved Billy. They had a great relationship, right? But they just looked at their calling, and they yielded to it according to their understanding, right? You can say, well, I don't care, you know, Billy missed it because the Bible said, you know, that's all right. It's his miss, not yours. But when you judge him... You'll miss. Come on. We're what? Thankful. Thankful. We appreciate God. We appreciate every church. Every church. You just don't have to get caught up in discussing what they do and don't do. You just do what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And you keep moving on. Why? We don't have time to sit down and debate. The day of face page, Facebook, right? I see there's people that are supernaturally dumb. <laughs> I think, right? And they write these comments and stuff. And I'm like, what? And, and I've got like half a book in here, you know, ready to just tell them what the scripture says and everything. And right before I put send, the Holy Ghost changes my finger and it goes to delete. And I said, but God, he said, but nothing. He said, I didn't call you to straighten people out. I called you to follow me. Come on. And do what I called you to do. Amen. Now look at this. A man approved of God, 
among you by miracles and wonders and signs. All right? It says, and how Jesus was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. A lot of people get Holy Ghost. They just don't yield to power. You got Holy Ghost. Why? Because I'm speaking this language I never did learn. What did you say? I don't know. Would you like to know? Well, the more that you use it, the more understanding will come to you of what you're saying. And you'll find out when you sit down to start praying for missionaries in other nations that actually you're praying how to be more loving to your spouse. See, the Holy Ghost is more concerned about how you're treating people in your own home than he is about how the missionaries are being treated in other nations. Why? Because the more you become a right as a family yourself, the more power display that'll come out of you, right? Because of agreement. Agreement is amazing. That's the reason in church, when we come into agreement, it just amplifies our abilities and our powers, right? And it isn't how many, I don't know about what, what happened over here, but in 2020, the, the year of the COVID, you know, no, it's the year of stupidity. <laughs> you know, you, what do you mean stupidity? Uh, it, it, it's just Christians folded like $2 su suitcases it's all over the place. <laughs> and go, Hang on a minute. Isn't Christ in you? Yeah. Don't you have the Holy Ghost? Yeah. yeah, but there's a virus. A virus? Well, where does it say that a virus has the ability and power to cause Christ to bow before him? It doesn't. It's every name bows to the name of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Amen. Every knee bows. Come on. Hello. And so we got people and they started these prayers and, and people I love and people I admire and people that, that I, I watch and learn from, I do, right? But it's just this religious thing that ends up coming up because it was planted there somewhere along the line and it comes out. If my people will humble themselves and pray and repent from their evil ways, I from heaven, God says, will heal their land. I, hang on a minute. Has God ever got all his people to agree? Ever? Maybe when it was just Moses, but I think Moses got in an argument with himself. <laughs> right? He kind of overstepped and caused, you know, the, the deliverance of Israel to be a, 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 an extra 20 years or something. Right? God said, what? They're going to be in bondage 400 years. They ended up being in bondage 430. Why? Because Moses jumped out and killed somebody. That's not good for a pastor. <clears throat> right? And so it, it delayed their outcoming. See, we look at it as a spectacular, amazing thing. You know, that God came in there and, 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 and he uh, turned the sand into, into lice and, you know, turned the water into blood and did all this stuff. And we go, yeah, yeah, do it, God. See, but God said before, you know, 30 years earlier, the people would have just walked out. See, sometimes we look at the Bible and that's the way it is. It happened exactly the way that God wanted. Hang on now. Do you know that King David wouldn't have been a king? Except Israel said, we want to be like other people. And God said, no, you don't. They said, yes, we do. We really do. Honest. He says, no, don't you know that if you have a king, he'll take all your young men, put them in his army. He'll take all your young daughters and, and put them in, in his harem and, and all that. And then, you know, take all your money and taxes and everything. And they said, okay. They said, well, give us a king. Right? And so they went out and they found Saul. He became king. Why? He was taller than everybody else. 
All right. Now, in the beginning, you know, he had a heart toward God, but it got to the place that God didn't matter. You know why? He was king. And God says what? I'll be God and I'll raise up judges that will deliver you. And I, God, will disperse the enemies. I'll do your fighting. Now, we want to be like these other people, right? How many Christians are still wanting to be like what's going on in the world? We think that true evangelism is bring the fads of the world into the church so that people can come in and fill it home. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> now look at this. Verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw saw the law always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, get this, did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with your countenance. So approved means uh, to authenticate and to accept the grace of God. How? through signs, wonders, and miracles. They've been called to happen in each and every one of our lives. Religion has boiled it down as the, the miraculous signs, wonders, and miracles are for the ministers, mainly the evangelist. Why? Because he's going where Christ has never been preached, and he needs these signs, wonders, and miracles to get people's attention. Why? So that he can get people born again. There's no verse that says that. But that's what we believe, right? As a matter of fact, the fivefold ministry is in each church, according to the scripture. Come on now. And what is this fivefold ministry? If you find out what it is, it says that it's given unto them these gifts. They're, they're, they're gifts from God, right? Fivefold ministry. Okay, you gotta be called of God to be an authentic, authentic, what does authentic mean? Approved. To be approved of God, to be a pastor, you need to be called of God to be a pastor. Or an evangelist, or a prophet, or a teacher, or an apostle. And see, we come through the place for many, many years that there's only two callings, and that's pastor and evangelist. Right? Someone jumped out and says, you know, are you a pastor or are you an evangelist? I'm a teacher. What is that? I've been called of God to teach. Well, do you have a church? No, I'm not a pastor. Oh, well, do you travel? No, I'm not an evangelist. You're a teacher. Yeah. Oh, okay. Whatever. <laughs> because we don't really see their position and importance. What does the Bible say? The fivefold ministry. See, the fivefold ministry are the ones that, that have the pulpit. They sit up. Everybody does things for them, right? <laughs> and everything, which is awesome. And then he, see, but the fivefold ministry was called of God, ordained of God, empowered by God, approved by God to be menders. Because you're the ministers. The fivefold isn't. You are. You are. Menders. What do you mean, menders? You remember when Jesus was walking along the shore of Galilee and he saw James and John and Peter? What were they doing? They were mending their nets. 
That's the same Greek word as the ministers that we are to uh, uh, preserve or, or uh, perfect the ministers or the ministry is the same thing. What are we doing? We're seeing that the body of Christ, the true ministers, have holes in their thinking. They have holes in their lives. All right. They think they're coming to God so that the fivefold can can mend them. But then once they get mended, they're still useless. All right. Come on. But you get mended for a reason. Why do they mend a net? Catch fish. Catch fish. It's not hard. Catch fish. He said, what? Come with me and I'll show you how to be fishers of men, people. You are the nets that catch people. Right? Amen. All right. Look at this. Uh, where are we at? Got a few minutes. Okay. Look at, <clears throat> I want you to look at second Timothy chapter two. Are you getting something? Yes. How we overcome failure is to come to the realization that I've been approved of God to live a life different than what I've lived. I've lived what I've lived because I didn't know any other way. But when my heart begins to open up to the truth, to the reality of God, and I begin to see that whatever it is I'm trying to get to and to get and to attain and to achieve, that God already gave it to me. It's already mine. I can look for my glasses and they can be on my head. Hello? I can look for the keys of my car and they can be in my hand. See, if I don't know where they are, I'm convinced I don't have it. And because you don't know where the gifting is, you don't know where the prosperity is, you don't know where the miraculous is, you're convinced you don't have it. But the whole time, it isn't you that has it. God has it, but you have God. The Holy Spirit has the gifts. You have the Holy Spirit. Right? And so when, when it dawns on us, I already have what it is that I desire, no matter what it is. What do you have? I'm prosperous. I already have more money than I'll ever need to pay my bills. I already have it. It's here. It's mine. Well, let me see it. Well, you can't see it. Not unless you get an agreement. Right? Why? Because it's in the unseen realm. But that doesn't change anything. It's just like I'm praying and believing that I'm healed. You need to say that you're healed. Well, I am. You, if I say I'm healed, then I will, will I get healed? And that's what a lot of people think. They think you're teaching them to go around saying, thank God I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. Praise God. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. Oh, pain's still there. Thank you, Jesus. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. Ooh, still looks bad. Thank you, Jesus. I'm healed. How, how long do I have to say I'm healed? Right? Come on. No, you say you're healed. Why? Because you are. When did Jesus bear the stripes for healing? 2,000 years ago. That's a long time before you got sick. Can you see how early and advanced that God sent the answer to your need? Yeah. Oh, think on it. Think on it. Everything I think I need to progress in life I already have. I need to become aware of it. Hang on now. God put someone in me to make me aware. He's called the Holy Spirit. My communication and my fellowship 
should be stronger with the Holy Spirit than with anyone. You're not dissing Jesus or the Father because it was the Father's idea and Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. What did he say? It is the utmost importance. Now, coming out of the mouth of Jesus meant there isn't anything more important. Doesn't exist. Well, what's the most important thing, Jesus? That I send the Holy Spirit. I got to go. I got to go. How many of you know that they didn't want him to go? Huh? Who would want him to go? Wait a minute. No. You see the disciples run, grab hold of his feet, try to pull him back down. You know, he said, no, I've got to. He's kicking their hands out of the way. He says, why? I have to go. Why you got to go? Because I got to send the Holy Spirit. He can't come till I go. So I got to go. But we need you. No, you need the Holy Ghost. See, they didn't understand. And so when he ascended, the Holy Spirit descended. And he descended with such a magnitude of power, right? That Peter opened up his mouth and said a few words. 3,000 people were ushered into the kingdom of God. That same Holy Spirit is in you. And he didn't lose any of his power. He has all the wisdom. It's all there. And he wants to move out of you. He wants to move through you. He wants to change your complete life. Amen. No matter how good you think it is, no matter how blessed you think you are, he is the improver. He can improve on anything and anyone. Amen. That's how you overcome failure is by learning how to yield to the Holy Spirit. He knows no failure. And when you follow him, when you listen to him, when you surrender to him, then he leads you on an ever increasing road of righteousness into victory. Right. But the moment you think it's you. You're going to slip off track. So we embrace it. What? With humility. What is humility? Humility is not beating yourself up and degrading yourself. Humility is the ability to accept and receive the righteousness of God and to be who Christ says you are. Amen. That's how you overcome failures. Why? There are no failures in the spirit of God. None. They don't exist. Amen. Thank you.